We've got a multi-level system here, so it's definitely not designed as a one-size-fits-all. Now, I know that the training that's been supported by the state government here has been primarily with seminars and groups, but there are 40 different variants of Triple P that have been developed or under trialling. Never forget that doing Triple P is highly skillful work, and the more you do of it, the better you get at it. And the thing is that, I mean, I've been doing this for many years now, and I'm still learning about how to do it. The, the, the complexities of working with families and children know no bounds, really. And so it's that having that lifelong openness to reflective practice, to learning about uh, what you're doing and how to do it better with Triple P is a really uh, terrific thing to be able to aim for. There's quite a um, scientific lit literature about peer mentoring, and um, it, it goes back really to some of the classroom management research that was done in the 1960s and 1970s that um, you know, basically used children's capacity to um, uh, observe their peers uh, as they were basically employed as peer behaviour managers and so a typical paradigm was that a disruptive child was sat next to another child whose job it was to monitor um, periodically whether the other child was on task or not and it was sort of like instead of the teachers catching the kids being good it was the peers catching the kids being good and they there were several studies that showed that children could be tra trained to be actually quite successful um, behavior um, changes in, in a classroom environment it then sort of moved to research that I was involved in I mean there's a whole lot of other research that others had done of course but I re um, ignited an interest in um, peer tutoring when I taught in a medical school for 16 years teaching uh, medical students about bedside interviewing and uh, communication skills and they used to hit the wards in pairs uh, they would um, uh, interview the other person would watch they would uh, the the other the other peer, peer would have a turn at interviewing another pa patient and their peer uh, tutor would watch them do it and then <laughs> they used to uh, play a tape back of the recorded interview and give each other feedback basically and we did a study that compared expert clinical tutors providing feedback to the med students on bedside interviewing versus peers who were at a similar level of experience and certainly not experts and we found that the quality of the interviews conducted at the end of this training program in interviewing and, and communication skills was significantly better for the peer mentored group than the clinical expert tutored group. Now we morphed that into training of clinical psychologists and it's uh, come through now as a strategy for promoting fidelity of practitioners learning to implement Triple P. Now I'd just like to um, have a little bit of discussion first of all in the role of being the practitioner what do you think is the um, the essence of the skill that you need to get the maximum benefit from putting yourself in that role of sharing a videotape sharing a case what kind of approach do you think you need to really learn from this and the role of the practitioner whose case it is that's being reviewed. And so the person you saw first was James. He was sharing his video and his little stuff up with the, the, the mother ticking her off for, you know, not having a supportive husband and that kind of thing. So what do you think, the, what, are, what are the essence of the skills that you need to be... Open to self-reflection. Yeah, you do, need to, you do need to be prepared to look at what you're doing. Um, and in what do you think that kind of process is challenging to people? Yes. I wonder why. It makes you vulnerable. You're okay, so you well, in fact, you, it's interesting though that uh, this vulnerability, if it declares itself, sometimes is not factually based because people feel vulnerable for a whole variety of different reasons when they're looking at themselves on a videotape. What do they think? What do they pay attention to? Oh, how, they how they look, yeah. How you're coming across and the things that, um, you know, how many ums and ahs you were saying instead of whether you were effectively uh, co conveying the information or, or doing what you were supposed to be doing. 
Um, not that unvenars aren't relevant, they are sometimes re relevant, but um, okay, so the, the so people can feel vulnerable. How else, what other kinds of emotions come up when you're in the spotlight, basically? Defensive. You can feel defensive. You may feel inadequate, if, particularly if you're asked to share a difficult moment. So if you're videotaping the group and you're preparing for a past session, you're asked to identify part of it that went well, part of it that you're uncertain about or that you felt a bit anxious about, but it means taking a risk taking a risk to share something that we often hide from our colleagues because most of the time our triple P work is done in private unless you're working in pairs but generally it's a solo experience for a lot of people. Okay so given that vulnerability and given that sort of um, kind of sometimes feeling of inadequacy or uncertainty about whether you've handled a situation properly, what do you need to be prepared to do as the person on the receiving end of the feedback? You've got to really listen to what people are saying and if so, if someone says to you something, oh, I didn't like that part, what would you say as the practitioner who's received that feedback? What didn't you like? You've got to clarify the reference so you understand what it is they're saying because it's easy to give glib feedback or say that was great, that was awful, I didn't like that. Um, but exactly what it was they're referring to. And so from a, uh, the practitioner on the receiving end of this feedback we need to be very um, non-defensive but making sure that we, if we're listening to a piece of feedback if it's either positive or negative, that we understand the referent and we force the person giving the feedback to be concrete and specific. Okay, are there any other skills from a practitioner's perspective in getting the most out of a past session? Apart from listening, yes. Um, is there any usefulness in connecting the parallel processes between what it is you're trying to do with parents or group? I think that's a great idea. When it's first introduced, I think it's just important in looking at the video, looking at the manual, it's a parallel process to what we're trying to do with parents. And that um, many of the skills that the peer mentor is using are skills that the, the, you would as a practitioner be uh, wanting to see. Okay, the, other, the, other, the only other thing I was going to say about being in the practitioner role here is that it does involve a bit of preparation. You get out of a past session what you put into it. If you treat it as a chore and a bore and you don't treat it with an as an opportunity to fine tune your skills and really learn how to do this better and better, um, you'll find it um, threatening, you'll find you won't, won't want to be there, but if, you, if you, you're investing in your own professional development and learning, you'll get a huge amount of value from this. Virtually every time we've run this past process around clinical trials and people being supervised with specific interventions, people have absolutely loved it as a process because it's, it's actually designed to be extremely supportive. But it works only under certain conditions. Let's turn to the peer mentor role now and just think for a moment of what the skills are that the peer mentor was demonstrating when you saw Cassie interacting with James. What, what kind of things do you think she needs to be able to do in order to be effective in that role? Being objective. Being objective. So she's actually got to be thinking about what he said when she said that. And so that sometimes means taking notes down of what was actually said. So when it comes to giving the feedback, you've got the verbatim of what was actually said. Okay, what else is needed? Yes. Um, empathic. I think she said something about I've had that experience too. So did you yeah, so it's a weeness, isn't it? You know, it's not a I'm the expert supervisor, you're the beginner. I'm going to tell you how to do it or teach you how to do it because it's hugely tempting when you've got a, a, a difference in level of experience to let that sort of just um, uh, take over the whole process so that in a sense you feel that as the beginner you've got to learn from the master. And this is a process where you're all experts or learning to do, do the intervention. Okay, anything else that you need to be able to do? Yes. You must have currency, you must be able to practice yourself. Yeah, so if, 
If you haven't seen a case for 20 years and you haven't been there, haven't done that, there's something about you've got to be a contributory member. You've got to have a turn, basically. And everyone know, if everyone knows, if you're going to be nasty to me, mate, <laughs> it's your turn next. <laughs> so, um, and it, it generally doesn't happen that way at all because you frame it up as a, as a very positive experience. Anything else you noted about being the peer mentor? Yes. Um, but you have to... Um Yeah, and, and so that, that notion of giving the uh, practitioner the opportunity to identify what they did well and didn't do quite so well. And you see, when James first evaluated what he did, we all thought, gee, this is a bit inflated. It, didn't you think that? His evaluation of how well he did. Um, it wasn't all that good. But she waited. She didn't jump in. She just let him t have, her, have his say. And then... But she got to it, didn't she? She got to what it was that needed to change. And how did she do that? The sandwich, giving a positive and then... Yeah, yeah. So started with the positive, And then what do you think you might need to do differently? Yeah. And so he, he was able to identify the part that didn't start off all that well. So she just let him go with that. If he hadn't said that, hadn't identified the troublesome part and, he's, and said something like, oh, I don't, I don't know, what do you think you would need have needed to have say, said there as the peer mentor? Remember, you're wanting to get to him to the piece where he is um, being critical of her saying that her husband wasn't supportive. Yes, yes, but you, you're, as a peer mentor, you've heard that, you saw the videotape, but now you're wanting to get him to focus his attention on it and he's missed it. Would you identify that part of the exchange and ask him how he think he, how he thought he went to Yeah, so let's go, can we just go back to that part where she had just told you that her husband wasn't cooperating uh, or, or, or hadn't been participating, I'm feeling as though I'm doing it on my own. Um, how do you think you handled that situation? Can you recall how it went? And if, the, if you say, oh, what do you mean? You say, you said, and then you give it to them. What you said is, and you don't do it in a sort of a challenging, hostile way, but you've got the verbatim to share with your colleague. So it's forcing them to consider whether that was effective or not in that situation. Now, if you think about how you would judge as a uh, peer mentor, whether you had been successful in your role, how would you know whether you've done a good job as a peer mentor? Yes, the, the, what was offered here is if your practitioner came up with a good solution or a good takeout, they had an action plan that they, uh, that they could do, if that was an outcome, you've done the minimally sufficient, the just enough for now the person to be this independent, self-regulated person's come up with a solution, got a plan, going to implement it, and your job in the future would be to review that. How did you go with that plan? To just remember it. So you're defining your effectiveness as a peer mentor by the skillfulness of your interaction and its effectiveness in producing change in your practitioner colleague. And the change is the takeout plan that they come up with and are committed to. If they don't have a takeout plan, if it's all vague and waffly and it's all sort of lovey-dovey and there's no kind of um, serious taking on board any of the feedback, have you been successful? I don't think so. Now, finally, in the practitioner, uh, sorry, in the um, peer facilitator role, what are the real skills in being able to do this properly? Time management, absolutely. What else? Bringing people back onto tasks. Yeah, and can that be hard for some people to do? What it, why is it hard sometimes to bring people who are in full flight on an irrelevancy back on task? <laughs> sort of interrupt. And so you do have to interrupt, don't you? <laughs> and you've got to be, it's like in a parenting group, you know, if someone's going miles off track, you know, that's very interesting. We can talk about that. Let's get back to this, this issue. So the refocusing, um, it, I mean, it highlighted the skills on the, in terms of the supers on there with smooth transitions and that kind of thing. But the, the main thing to keep in mind is that 
it's a highly structured interaction, it's got an agenda, and it's got a real purpose. Um, if you think about the value that this could add to your own professional work, um, what would be um, fantastic for you to be able to do would be to form some peer mentoring groups. The idea in, uh, that we would recommend is that when you're starting to do pe peer mentoring, if you do a, um, a, a fortnightly uh, session that then moves to a monthly session. We recommend about six fortnightly sessions and then to a monthly session, but it works best in fact, it only works when you've got real cases and you're bringing along either video, audio, or really detailed case notes. You know why? Why do you think it might be so important to have real cases with real footage as opposed to coming along and just trying to recollect what happened in a session? We kid ourselves. <laughs> we do. We do it all the time. We always think we're so much better than we are. Uh, we try to kind of um, bolster our kind of self-esteem, I suppose, along, that, along those lines. What's been found is there's actually very little concordance between what actually happens in a session and what practitioners recall about actually what happens in a session. And so you could be getting feedback about what you're saying happened in a session that didn't even happen. <laughs> and so it's kind of, um, this is taking you to a different level of professionalism and support in your delivery of Triple P. And I mean, if you see it as a challenge, when well, we were talking before about, you know, men needing a challenge, uh, but, but I, I think we all need a challenge to be challenged enough to be constantly trying to improve the way we work with families. And then it's so much more rewarding. You feel as though that you're really learning all the time and your level of expertise and experience is just going up and up and up. It's wonderful to see that happening. Um, okay, let me at this point uh, change tact slightly about <coughs> thinking about this concept of within session resistance. Jerry Patterson back in um, 1994 wrote a paper in clinical psychology research and practice with Patty Chamberlain, uh, they were from the Oregon Social Learning Center. Um, they had many years of experience in doing one-on-one -on -one individual therapy with uh, mainly primary school aged children uh, who were aggressive and in conduct problem and they wanted to study the process of um, resistance that they would experience as clinicians in sessions. And they constructed this kind of model that I'll work you through very briefly because there's a simple take out here. That is, they're saying when parents are coming to us who've had significant problems with their children, euphemistically they've had this history of 10,000 defeats. What, this, what they were meaning by that is that the coercive parent-child interactional process would often be a situation the parent would be on the losing end of. The child would win, there would be an escalation, the parent would cave in and they'd be in this escalation trap. Um, that history creates strong negative emotion when you're exposed to a lot of negativity with your children in the sense that when parents are now coming to a professional or are told to go to see a professional, they often feel anger because they've had these conflictual exchanges with their kids and there's been a lot of shouting and negativity. They can often feel contempt for someone who's daring to advise them on how they should raise their kids. And there's a pervasive sense of sadness that's underlying it all that their idealised sort of notion of being a good parent with great kids is contradicted by having this child they see as a monster or as someone who's out of control. Um, and there's a fear that if this is what he's like as a nine-year-old, what's he going to be like at 15 when he's this much taller than me? So. They argue that the parents with this kind of history often have strong emotions associated with the history and then in addition they have their own story about that history, about why it happened and why the child is like this and this relates to their attributional framework, their beliefs about the origins of these problems and quite often parents who've had this history will be looking for an explanation that doesn't involve them. 
He's just like his father. He's always been like, in fact, he's like his grandfather. He's a nightmare, this kid. He's always going to be like that. I can tell. You know, the stable ne internal negative attribution about why a child uh, can't change and why he's difficult. And then attributions for their own behaviour. Well, how would you expect me to behave? How would you be if you had to live with this for 13 years or 9 years or whatever it is? Um, I've had it with this kid. It's your turn. You know, this notion of being fed up, having had it um, with the kid, ready to do a, uh, get a, a, a child divorce, you know, to exit from the, the parental responsibility. Now, Patterson says that history creates resistance at a particular moment in the therapeutic process. When it's history taking, when it's listening, clarifying, summarising, checking, Resistance tends to be low. Parents will spend a lot of time complaining, um, you know, telling you about their life story, how difficult it is, why it can't happen that way. They argue the resistance starts to occur once you start to make pressure for change, when you start explaining the reason for something or starting to teach or introduce a new skill or strategy. Of course, this is what we do in Triple P. And then he said, Resistance escalates. In successful outcomes, the escalation is uh, temporarily abated by the therapist moving back to big ear therapy, being a listener, reflecting. It stays low, but with no behavioural change occurring in the parent, so long as the practitioner stays at that empathic stage. What the practitioner needs to be able to do is move back to the psychoeducational process of teaching, explaining, demonstrating if behaviour changes to occur in the parent. And so they track this kind of alternate pathway um, for outcomes depending upon the return to the psychoeducational active teaching process. They basically said, look, the more disadvantaged the parent is, the lower the SES, the poorer the educational level, the more miserable the parent is, the, the greater the history of antisocial behaviour, the high level of stress, they're more likely to be in this category of resistive parent within a session. But sometimes, and this is the take home message, the problem is that we inadvertently get trapped into reinforcing the self-defeating and avoidance behaviour on the part of the parent. Remember, the parent is avoiding taking responsibility and making change. And the avoidance is completely consistent with their history. With the, this history of, you know, um, being on the losing end of escalative encounters with kids, which means that you're constantly avoiding, you know, um, bushfires and, and uh, any kind of escalation and so the thought of having to do something different to confront your child to deal with the, the behaviour in a different way leads to this sort of uh, resistance. <coughs> okay so I just wanted to, yes? Um, in terms of the locus of change, did you say? Or stages of change? Yeah, if you, th if you think about um, the parent who's pre-contemplative, contemplative, ready for action, I mean, these are parents who are not ready for action. You know, they're, but unfortunately they've taken an action which has come to an appointment. So they've been pre-contemplative enough to get to making a decision, okay, I've got to go along and see someone, but they're actually not ready um, at that moment to make, uh, make the kind of commitment that's needed to move forward. What I would see is different, however, between the model that you're talking about and what you actually need to do to resolve it, is that um, for, for parents who are resistive, Sometimes the resistance comes because we forget the self-regulatory mechanisms. So what happens is that the practitioner might say something like, um, well, Mrs. Smith, um, your child has got what we call a conduct disorder. It's quite common, you know, it affects about um, three in ten kids uh, of children of this age. Um, we can do something about it, but um, 
you know, yeah, it's, a, it's called a Conda problem. We need to understand where this problem is coming from. Um, you know, basically children with this kind of behaviour pattern who are resistive and they don't do as they're told and they're argumentative, etc. Um, it's often because of how the parent is managing the problem. Um, the thing I noticed in doing an observation with you that you were, um, you know, pretty inconsistent and you didn't sort of follow through and um, I didn't notice much attention when giving to him when he was behaving well. You seem to argue a lot with your partner. Um, you know, um, when he escalates, you go rubbery at the knees and uh, just cave in. The problem, Mrs. Smith, is you, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so when you, when you think about um, that way of conveying um, the problem and the causes of the problem, that's absolutely antithetical to Triple P. We would get the parent to think about possible reasons that might, might have occurred. The video can be shown, the parent is reflecting upon what they've identified as being contributing to the problem and then sharing with us and other parents their conclusions about it. So what are they resisting against? You're not creating a, a sort of a, um, a threat scenario for them where, they're, um, where they can put up the barriers really. And we find in Triple P there's much less resistance around this phase of moving from the listening to the explaining, demonstrating because of the adoption of the self-regulatory framework. Um, I mean, do you find generally when you're delivering Triple P and you're going through the possible reasons for behaviour problems that there's pretty little resistance from parents with that? Yep. Um, and get to know each other and their basic like ground rules, that sort of thing. And yep. we start Triple P in the second week. Yep. Um, and we find that most of the resistance come in before we put the activities into place. Once we yep. start, it's fine. But what we've done in the first week now is um, show the video segment of driving mum and dad mad. Yep. The Jamie one. Yep. People say, it won't work for my child, yeah. I've tried everything. Then they see Jamie. <laughs> and then it kind of leaves them nowhere to go because yeah. they're not getting the knives out yeah. and you know, shooting them. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. I mean, I also think the fact that you're making a special effort to get those pre-assessments done, um, you know, it's worth de dealing with that bit of resistance from the parent there because you really need the data to, you know, track the outcomes. Kids with conduct problems being identified as being relatively impoverished in terms of emotion words, emotion language to describe their feelings. Um, uh, in research that Mark Dads has been involved in, they've generated fewer um, emotion words and less specific emotion terms when they're describing uh, their experiences. Um, they tend to poor, perform more poorly on tasks assessing knowledge of emotion, including uh, understanding of the causes of emotional experience, um, uh, their ability to recognise that different emotions can evoke different emotions in other, in other people, or that people have different uh, reactions to the same, same situation emotionally, uh, and later uh, being able to uh, appreciate that people can experience mixed emotions in, uh, in particular situations they encounter. Now the argument has been that the parent-child interactional context provides um, a situation for learning about and recognising um, and learning to express uh, emotions or feelings uh, appropriately through activities such as um, reminiscing and reviewing uh, past events that have been distressing or upsetting, um, the parent making themselves available for a discussion with the child about how they might have been feeling and then coaching the child with emotion coaching strategies about how they're going to deal with that sort of feeling or emotion state. And so there's a kind of a literature that's developed around uh, kind of emotion coaching with, with children that we were interested in examining the question of if you delivered group triple P but with an emotion focus, so the same skills and strategies but for every skill and strategy not only the behaviour but the associated emotions would be talked about, would be discussed and parents would be given homework and strategies to do that involve this kind of reminiscing and discussion of feelings and uh, promotion of children's uh, emotion vocabulary and so on. And the question we were looking at is, 
If you do this, will it improve outcomes for children uh, or for parents for that matter? Um, now this is an example of something that from a creativity perspective you would think that's a really sensible thing to try to do. To take the developmental literature, to blend it in a practical strategy that could be infused into Triple P and now to test whether it adv adds value. Okay, um, now let me just check uh, in the group, just raise your hands if you think it would have improved outcomes. Okay, raise your hands if you think it would have made no difference. Raise your hands if you would have thought that it could have made it worse. Okay, so there's a couple who thought made it worse, more felt it was, um, you know, could have added to the benefit. Well, this is the beauty of doing randomised trials, you know, because you put these um, hunches to the acid test and you really see what happens. With no great preconceived ideas, one way or another, but reflecting a preparedness on the part of Triple P to look at it to see whether it would improve the outcomes. This is what we found. This is the study that uh, Karen Salmon, uh, myself, and Cassie Didman uh, from the University of Auckland, uh, Karen Sammons from the Victoria University of Wellington. Um, we did, this is a study with uh, early onset conduct problem children randomly assigned to the regular group Triple P or the emotion enhanced version of Triple P. What we found is that um, the emotion enhanced version of Triple P produced greater changes in this is observed interaction between parents and children uh, in their use of emotion labels with uh, uh, quite a, a, a high, large effect size, well it's a medium to large effect size, um, a greater likelihood of the discussion of the causes of the problem with the child and the use of emotion coaching so that these were clearly teaching the parents the skills that were thought to be important relating to children learning about emotion language and uh, greater emotional literacy. Um, what we found is that the regular Triple P was significantly more effective than doing this emotion enhanced Triple P in changing children's behaviour in the short term and there was absolutely no evidence that the addition of these skills improved outcomes for either children or parents. Okay, they learned the skills, they implemented the skills, it wasn't that they weren't clinically meaningful or valid, but it didn't improve the outcomes at all. In fact, both interventions were comparable in their improvements in dysfunctional parenting practices, parental self-efficacy, parental distress, and parents were similarly satisfied with both interventions. Now, the, the point that um, this is leading to is that because you can doesn't mean, always mean you should and sometimes um, something that's a pretty major change like adding an emotion coaching element to the delivery of Triple P if it's being done then the best context to do it is in a trial where we're testing it out properly with proper follow-up assessments of outcomes and that kind of thing. Now our um, exploration of this, um, at least in this study and the way in which the emotion coaching was done, remember it was well received clinically, the, the parents were happier with the intervention but it actually didn't improve outcomes and weakened the short-term outcomes. Now exactly why they would do worse uh, short-term, it's it's, it's not entirely clear, it was maybe parents got confused at times about how best to deal with, you know, if a kid's throwing a tantrum, do you attend to the underlying emotion or just deal with the tantrum and follow through with the routine, maybe they found that easier, but it doesn't still explain why, um, you know, these, the, the increased use of these emotion coaching skills, it should have improved outcomes not just kept it the same or, or um, uh, in this instance made the child outcome uh, significantly worse, at least in the short term. In the long term the differences uh, kind of washed out and, and it was interesting that um, the, 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 the emotion 
language that children were acquiring was just as great in the regular triple P as it was with the emotion enhanced triple P. So if you're interested in sort of children's emotional literacy and their learning about feelings and expressing them and so on, it seems that we can actually still accomplish a lot within the regular delivery of triple P. Um, so if we're asked the question at the moment about does adding this emotion coaching element improve outcome, the answer appears to be no. But does the, um the length of the emotional coaching matters, like how... It went, it went for eight sessions. It was, it was, coaching. yeah, it was an identical session length, but every session had an integrated focus on emotion. There was always homework tasks related to the emotional domain. So um, we thought if you added uh, uh, an extra six sessions of emotion coaching, um, you'd have to match six extra sessions of triple P so they'd be comparable in length because it could, be, could simply mean that you've got a longer intervention versus a shorter intervention. So they needed to be the same session length. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, could it be because triple P is about fostering child's self-regulation anyway? It could well be, you see, because this is what I suspect is happening. We had a, an extra measure in here of children's kind of uh, emotion regulation that's not, not on here that was showing a significant advantage for the regular triple P on that measure. So it's, it, it, because of the self-regulatory focus, um, you know, that, that, but you see there was still a self-regulatory focus in the enha emotion enhanced triple P. So they both had that focus. Um, it's just that adding the emotion coaching specific element, the reminiscence about, you know, the, the fight you had with your brother and the talking about it and why are you feeling that way and then how do you think you might deal with that tomorrow didn't it add any value to, to improving the outcomes. Any other questions about that? Okay, at this point, let's just open it up for the last 10 minutes. You can ask me anything you like about Triple P, flexibility, tailoring, anything you like. Um, you've mentioned it before, but there's a lot of controversy in the community about time out, time in, etc. Yep. Um, I think Triple P gets itself a bad name because of that. So I just want to give a comment. Well, the thing you've got to remember is that there is no evidence whatsoever to show that children who receive time out have any threat to their emotional security, have any threat to their attachment. Most of the evidence relating to the effects of Triple P shows that it improves relationships. Parents get on better with their kids, they're closer to their children. The thing about the kind of the the, the time in, time out kind of scenario, I mean we've historically used the word time in to refer to the rest of the time that children are not in time out. It's used in other programs in a different way, I know. But the thing that's important to remember is that children in learning to regulate their emotion, to learn to calm down, to get over something that's upsetting, they're more likely to do that in an environment of stability, predictability, a good parent-child interaction where there's lots of positivity taking place. So it's in fact a contrast to being in a positive time in environment. When in my view you throw a parent in to the calm down process, particularly to create a level of prompting, encouraging, you know, do the breathing together, calming down or holding. Um, this creates a situation where children learn to rely on others to calm themselves down. What we want kids to be able to do is to calm themselves down wherever they are, in any setting, whether their mum mum's there or not. And so, I mean, the other th practical thing is that if you've got to do sort of holding routines and, and uh, kind of this sort of nurturance and loving nurturance around children who are, who are very upset, it means other parenting can't go on. You've got two or three other kids who are screaming and out of control. It's a very practically difficult routine to, to implement at times. Yeah, but you see, sometimes rules are created for childcare environments that are based on really bad policy, poor evidence. And, you know, if you think about it, if a child is throwing a massive temper tantrum, they're screaming and kicking and so on, and you're not allowed to provide 
put the child in an environment where they can safely calm down and you're involved in having to distract them and you know talk them out of it and they get this massive secondary gain for this massive performance and people who say you know the, 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 the kids in this situation you just need to divert them and get them onto another activity it's, it's really, really difficult when you've got very difficult kids. And so you're tying people's hands behind their back. You're saying that they can't do what parents are allowed to do that are effective in managing these problems. And for what reason? Where is the evidence anywhere that this damages children? I know of no evidence of this, and there's been many studies that have looked at the effects of, of, of time out. It's, it's, look, there's no doubt, it sometimes doesn't work with some kids, but lots of things don't work with some kids. And then it's a question of getting the right combination of strategies and so on. Um, time out sometimes doesn't work with kids where it's been abused in the past, and they've learned to associate it with, um, you know, horrible parental escalation, and it's been used more as a punishment. But people who sort of cast a time-out routine as a punishment, it's not even thought, we don't even think of it as a punishment. It's a time away from something positive. It's a calm-down time. It's interesting in Sweden, when Triple P was introduced in, um, um, in Sweden, you know, the home of the rights of children and all of this stuff, and um, there was a major issue about time out. You know, a, a paediatric professor, as soon as he heard it, I was coming into the country, he was in the press sort of saying this horrible routine, blah, blah, blah. You know, the interesting thing is that we worked out with the Swedes that what they preferred to use is, let's get rid of the word time out, and we're just going to now call it calm down. <laughs> Same strategy, but we're going to call it calm down. And now it's perfectly appropriate. You know, it's accepted, it's, oh, it's not that evil time out. Exactly the same procedure. <laughs> yes. I have two questions. To ask you, uh, the first question is about a time out. Yeah. I think there was a case, uh, I think one of, the, one, of my, one of the parents from my group yep. asked me the question that when her child was throwing the tantrum, yep. And time out that I advise to put the child, you know, like whatever the child yeah. doing, stop it. And then try to put, you know, like send him to the, the chair, I call the naughty chair. Yeah. Put, you know, on the corner in the house. And the child try to get off the chair by screaming out. And yeah, it. yeah. And make the mother be more scared, you know, like, oh, I. Ha okay, first. Situation. Well, first of all, I would recommend not using the word naughty chair because we're not doing super nanny here. Um, and even though it's, it's got the wrong connotation to it, if it's in the same environment, we call it quiet time. And they're put in that place, and if they don't stay there, it's backed up with a timeout. Um, the parent has to make a decision. The timeout could be on the bottom of the stairs, it could be another room. Um, they've got to make a decision that if they're not going to close the door to keep the child in, they have to be prepared to keep taking the child back. Um, and sometimes this requires a level of persistence and determination on the part of a parent that is for a child with a very severe conduct problem. Um, I mean, I've, I've had a case where the parent um, has had to use the taking the child to time out on a single episode 40 times. <laughs> on the first day, nothing on the second day. By the end of the week, the behaviour had virtually gone. Because remember, what you're dealing with is a history of a child who's learnt to escalate. And then now, this escalation is not going to work anymore. Sorry, son. You know, you're going to have to accept that when mum says you need to do something, it's going, going to happen. And you can't hit me, you can't escalate, you can't shout at me to make me back off from doing this. If you reassure yourself that what the parent has been asked to do is fair and reasonable, age appropriate, then stick to your guns with it. Sorry, yep? I guess the It is, but it's a, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And we're talking about, if you think about a day in the life of a child, and we think about a single episode of a child going into a timeout that, you know, 
Uh, often, for most kids, after the first few times, they're down to the couple of minutes before they're, they can get out, and it's over with pretty quickly. But the kids who go on for half an hour or, or more sometimes, you know, if you think about that, out of their lifetime, it's a nanosecond. But it's something that is a circuit breaker for some of these kids who've become so emotionally dysregulated that they know no other way of dealing with their emotion other than to lash out. Now, that ch who shows Jamie, the, j the example with Jamie? You see, there's a really interesting transition point with Jamie where he finally, it finally sticks, doesn't it? Do you notice that change in him? And it's, it's like he's emotionally reprocessing the whole situation. But that mum has kept to her guns, hasn't she? Yeah, she kept taking him back up to the room, <sighs> putting him in time out. And yeah. he could eventually go to his sister's birthday party. Yeah. Um, they, they wanted, do you want me to have, do you want me to be your brother? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yes. It's sort of convincing parents, isn't it, that that it will succeed, and I think that's a good way of doing. You know, showing an example. Yeah, it's. You have to actually persist, and it's hard. It is hard, but a lot of good things are hard. Yeah. yeah. And you know, this. Uh, yes. Sorry. Down the back. Um, I was just wondering. This is a different part. Now, could you introduce? At risk of harming their children, you mean? Ah. Uh, yes, but um, we've developed a version of Triple P called Baby Triple P as an antenatal transition to parenthood intervention. It's in clinical trial stage at the moment. The anticipation is that when we've got enough data to justify its dissemination, um, then that will be a really useful addition to the skill set with Triple P because it will be preparatory. And there's a trial that's about to begin in Scotland called the Thrive Trial. Uh, and it's comparing head-to-head -head Baby Triple P or an enhanced version of Baby Triple P with a program called Mellow Bumps, which is an attachment-based program, as an antenatal intervention for highly vulnerable, at-risk uh, parents, the sort of parents you're talking about. Okay, well, one last question. Yes? yes um, two questions. Um, one, <laughs> one, please. <laughs> Okay, I'll ask the, the um, no, the one is actually just short, just to say yes or no. Okay. Now, the first one is, would you recommend the delivery of triple P to a group of parents who've had um, drug and alcohol related problems? Yes, I would. We have now got some very interesting clinical um, experiences with the delivery of triple P with drug and alcohol affected parents who are not having access to their kids. Who are not having access to the kids, that's a slightly different issue. The main thing is that they um, need access to their children to practice the skills. Yeah, Even fathers that we're delivering triple P with in prison are getting some access to their children to practice the skills. Um, I would say, look, you can deliver triple P to those parents but don't expect it to stick because you need a transition point where they're actually putting it into practice. But supervised access, that kind of thing, could be the context. What was the other question? Yeah, the other one is on this fidelity and, and, and flexibility. flexibility. Yep. Yeah. You know, remember when I talked about um, the telephone interview session? Yep. I'm particularly interested in that because some of the clients that I work with, I can't understand their language. Yes. And I did yep. say that um, one of the strategies that I use is actually giving more time, more sessions, so that I could actually demonstrate the strategies and actually see that happening with the parents as well by sort of... Um, with their children? Yeah, no, no, no. Or just with them? Yeah, yeah. Look, I would say the main issue is that if you're not doing phone calls and you're substituting it with human interaction, that's fine. Particularly if it's geared to practicing the skills, yeah, which that's is, okay. that's, that's, that's fine, absolutely. Okay, well I'd just like to thank you everyone for your attention today. I know it's been a bit of a marathon and uh, hopefully you've found the, this, the whole session uh, enjoyable and, and useful. So thanks for having me down here again.